hopefully you can all hear me okay. Um, apologies if there's a bit of background noise. I'm in the office at the moment and um, people are just starting to leave for the end of the day. So there's there's a bit of traction. So hopefully it will calm down. Um, just to say, Toomey is joining us, but she may be a little bit late. So she's asked me to um, to make sure uh, that I start to chair, um, chair the um, meeting and then she'll join as soon as she can. She uh, one of the things that we did want to say before we start off was just a reminder for you to tell your parish clerks that the 17th of yeah. April, there's a parish clerk event which will be held in the council chamber at Camborne. So please, this is specifically for parish clerks. I think we've had around 30 that have already accepted. It's during the day, you will get a chance to meet a, a number of um, colleagues from both the planning service and other service that work with us. But there will be specific training for the parish clerks on some of the um, more topical things that we um, frequently uh, come across and hopefully we can help. Uh, and it's a two way process that we want the parish clerks to obviously have the opportunity to talk to us as well. Um, we will be holding another event for parish um, chairs that will be later on in the year, so probably around October. But uh, just putting that on your agenda, please ask them to confirm that they can come along. So that will be great. Um, I have got apologies. Uh, apologies is uh, from um, a colleague, uh, um, Councillor Katie Thornborough, as you know, we're a Greater Cambridge Shed planning service with Cambridge City Council um, and uh, Councillor Thornborough usually comes along, but unfortunately can't make tonight. So um, I'll, I'll move next. Uh, Anna, was that a question about the event? Did no, you want it was to... just it was just to observe that I'm I just wanted to um, remind uh, the who the proposal the person who prepared the agenda that it's Lee Hillam, not Lee Hillman, and and and, and as you can see his name, which is on our screens. <laughs> so it was just <laughs> thank you, Hannah. That had already been brought to my attention okay. by Councillor Brian, okay. and I have already amended the agenda and given my apologies to Lee. Okay, that's fine. Uh, that's fine. Thank you for pointing that out, Anna. That's really helpful. Um, I can see that Toomey's joined us, so we'll do our introductory now as normal, where we introduce uh, officers. So um, if that's OK, I'll start off with Toomey, who is the exec member for planning. So Toomey, I think everybody knows. But... Uh, good evening, everyone, and uh, thank you for joining us. Hope you can hear me clearly enough. Um, Yes, uh, Toomey Hawkins, uh, South Cam District Councillor uh, for Codicott Ward and been responsible for planning uh, for the last mm, years. Um, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Toomey. Uh, so I'm Heather Jones. I'm the Deputy Director for Greater Cambridge Shared Planning. So I'm just going to pick offices as I see them on the screen and they can introduce themselves. So John Cornell. Good evening, John Cornell, uh, Natural Environment Team Leader for Greater Cambridge Shed Planning. Uh, Lee Hillam. Yes, yeah, so I'm Lee Hillam. I'm the Principal Operations Manager um, for South Cam's District Council, and I look after services such as street cleaning, awarded watercourses, enviro crime, and services that are frontline to the public. Thank you, Lee. Uh, Bev? Oh, hi everyone. You already know me, but I'm supporting the meeting and apologies again for the um, hiccup we've had with Zoom, but hopefully we're all right now. Uh, Nancy? Hello, my name's Nancy Kimberly. I'm a Principal Planning Policy Officer. I'm sorry I've got a bit of a cold, so my voice is a bit hoarse this evening. Thank you, Nancy. Uh, Nicole? Good evening, everybody. I'm the um, senior websites officer in the communications team. Um, so it's nice to be with you this evening. And then I think we've got John uh, on the call as well. Hello, John Dixon, planning policy manager. Thank you, John. Uh, so I think that's all um, the introductory for uh, members and officers. So um, Bev, have we got any other apologies? Oh. 
You're on mute, Ben. There's always one, isn't there? Um, Councillor Katie um, sends her apologies. Lovely, thank you. So um, our usual uh, format, so we'll go through the presentation. At the end of each presentation, you'll have the chance to ask questions. We would ask that you put them either in the chat or put your hand up and we'll try and um, manage that. Um, and then, I, uh, and then um, at the end of the all of the presentations, there'll be an opportunity for an open forum for questions. Um, Toomey, are you? Do you want to take over chair, or are you happy for me to continue? Uh, no, I'm I'm happy for you to carry on. Thanks very much for doing that. Uh, <laughs> one, right. one thing I wanted to say is, uh, can um, can we have uh, on the chat if people could put their names and the parish councils they yeah, represent? Yeah. That would be very helpful uh, for us, so we know who's attended. Please, thank you very much. Lovely, thank you. Uh, so our first update is from John Cornell, uh, I think, who has to leave a bit earlier tonight. So John, over to you. Thank you very much, Heather. I was wondering if you were going to remember that, if I was going to get kicked to the end again, but but well done. So um, I've got a, a presentation for you this evening um, about biodiversity net gain, uh, again, but particularly around the biodiversity metric, which uh, is the, uh, the table, the form that's used um, by our ecologists to measure this. And uh, it's going to be a little bit dry, maybe, but we'll, we'll do our best to get through. And uh, hopefully there'll be some interesting questions at the end. So I'm going to share my screen now with you all, and then hopefully we can uh, make it work. So let me know if this uh, all looks as it should. OK. Yeah, I'm guessing. Good. I can't see any of you anymore. So it's all just gone. It's all just gone a funny colour. But anyway, as I said, so biodiversity net gain, measuring things up. Uh, that's the name of the presentation. So let's remind ourselves. Um, well, where are we? Uh, we are, I think, um, hang on a sec. I think we're somewhere where my PC doesn't want to do what it should. That's interesting. Let's do that then. OK, apologies. Right. So. Here we all are. What a oh. wonderful place, isn't it? Isn't it lovely? That's our home. And of course, there's a great deal of us. There are 8 billion of us currently and counting about 67 million people in the UK. Um, do you know it would take you 200 lifetimes to eat 8 million bananas? Now, I mean, that was that that was a, a fact that I shared with some school kids the other day. Um, it just gives you a sense of just how many 8 billion is. It's a very very big number. Um, biodiversity on the brink. We have a lovely place to live, but unfortunately we're doing our best to mess it up. So million species are threatened with extinction right now, more than any other time in history, uh, disappearing at an alarming rate a thousand times the norm. And the culprit, the bad guy, is, uh, is us humans. We're consuming, producing, traveling, living in ways that are not really very sustainable. Now, I do apologize. I've got pictures of uh, tropical rainforests in my presentation. And of course, we're not in the tropics, but broadly speaking, the same kind of thing is going on. We are losing habitats, um, you know, at an alarming rate. And um, part of that in the past historically has been through development. And uh, what we're trying to achieve in Greater Cambridge, indeed reversing that, not just protecting our habitats, but actually enhancing those habitats and ensuring that we can uh, put back more than is lost through development. Of course, if we were to fly over, have a look down, it all looks very green and lovely, doesn't it? Uh, that's South Cambridgeshire district there with the boundary and the city of Cambridge in the middle, about 940 square kilometres, about 300,000 of us, um, 180 per square kilometre. I could go on yeah. with statistics, but I, I don't want to bore you. Um, it looks very green, but it's it's mainly farmland. There's not much land for nature. If we were to overlay where our developments are taking place, um, we've got quite a few large developments. These numbers may be a little bit off there, not quite as off as uh, Mr. Gove would have had you believed mm -hmm. a, a couple of a couple of months ago, but nevertheless, about fifty to sixty thousand new homes between now and 2041. Um, so we need to put these in the the right places. We need to ensure 
that the uh, the plan the decisions are balanced uh, the need for economic growth the need to protect our biodiversity um, etc cetera, etc cetera. lots and lots of competing variables um if we were to map this out spatially we could see we've got Camborne here um the growth in Camborne we've got long stanton um and north so there at water beach a lot of fringe sites and some other bits and pieces going on that's where the, the development's broadly taking place if we to zoom into Camborne um this is a lovely aerial shot and it shows uh, i think that's upper Camborne and some nice green area look at that this is achieving balance and the way that this balance has been achieved um, for Camborne is actually by accident, would you believe? This lovely green area that you can see should have been a golf course, um, apparently, I'm told. Um, it was never developed as a golf course. And so now we have a wonderful country park which balances the urban development there that you can see and the natural environment, which is not just good for nature, good for people, recreation, um, carbon sequestration, the list goes on and on. And, um, you know, this has happened by accident, really, in, in a way, in Camborne. But what we're hoping is through biodiversity net gain, we can achieve more and more of this kind of thing in the developments that we have in Greater Cambridge uh, going forward, not by accident, but by design. You may have heard uh, about biodiversity net gain. I'm sure you've heard um, about it already. Biodiversity net gain is a it's a new approach to development that aims to leave the natural environment in a measurably better place, better state than it was before that development took place. It does sound counterintuitive, but it is possible. Um, and it's be, it's about nature recovery now. It's not just about sort of you know putting back what we've uh, managed to damage. It's about putting back more than is is lost through that development. So it's stepping beyond protection and into enhancement. That's what biodiversity net gain does. Now I could give you a, 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 a graphic here that, that shows it quite simply. In the old days, uh, we have this no net loss model of uh, protecting biodiversity. That's that green blob. Imagine that green blob at the top is your development site. It's a field. Put your uh, development in the middle of it. And what you're looking to do is essentially replace what you have taken. That model was called no net loss. And unfortunately, what used to happen more often than not is it would result in net loss for a number of reasons. Um, the new model, biodiversity net gain model, seeks to not just replace what is lost through development, but to add a little bit more. Um, the Environment Act states that's going to be 10%. That's now mandatory um, for most developments in England. Um, and it ensures that by taking uh, this approach of net gain, that we can hopefully little by little add more and more quality habitats in the places that people need them around developments um, and, and in places where that biodiversity can thrive. Um, this follows something called the mitigation hierarchy model. I told you it'd be dry, didn't I? Um, mitigation hierarchy, above all, if you can avoid doing the damage in the first place, you avoid it. If you cannot avoid it, you minimise the damage you do. If you cannot minimise, you rectify. Cannot rectify, you reduce. And finally, if you can't do any of those, um, you offset the damage. Um, this is where biodiversity offsetting comes in. A different way of visualising that would be to look at this. Um, this is a, I guess it's a bar chart. So along the y-axis, you have your net impact on biodiversity, positive and negative. Along the x-axis, which goes across the screen, you've got a line which is your, your no net loss line. And as we go from left to right, your biodiversity impact is um, first avoided, minimised, restored, and then this final piece here, offsetting, crossing that line of no net loss into offset, we have a, a positive impact on biodiversity. That's the theory. Um, we need to measure this. And one of the reasons why the no net loss model was so poor was that uh, different developers, different ecologists used slightly different ways of measuring that baseline and measuring what they were doing. And so that inconsistency often produced um, very different results, varying results. 
What we now have is uh, something called the biodiversity metric. It's been produced by DEFRA, the Department of Environment, Farming, and Rural Affairs, and it introduces a consistency into the planning process, which should allow us to um, more confidently predict, measure uh, the impact on biodiversity and the remedial mitigation for that impact. And so the biodiversity spreadsheet, biodiversity metric is a, a spreadsheet. It's an Excel spreadsheet, um, not particularly complicated, uh, you might think, but it, it, it is complicated. It's got algorithms and all kinds of other stru uh, stuff in it to ensure that uh, these biodiversity units are calculated correctly. Uh, as I said, it ensures consistency. It uses habitat as a proxy for biodiversity value. And it's designed as a tool to aid decision making, but it's not a substitute for expert advice. We will still need ecologists, trained, competent people to interpret what's gone in, into, into this tool. Uh, it doesn't change or override mitigation hierarchy or other protections, uh, policies, licensing or consents. So it's a new tool in our toolbox and um, it looks a little bit like this. This is a bit of a screenshot. I'm, I'm not about to open one up and start working through. You'll all be asleep within minutes, I'm sure. But essentially, um, <laughs> essentially, the, um, the the tool is based on Excel and uh, it's looking to record four different things. Habitat size, so how large is the habitat? Habitat condition, what is the condition? Is it a functioning habitat? What about the distinctiveness? Is it particular ecological importance? And what about the strategic significance? Is the habitat a local priority only, or is it located in the priority area of habitat creation and enhancement? Now, if you go to the government website and look at their guidance, that's a 76 page PDF, by the way. So uh, another challenge for me to cover this in 15 minutes today. But um, the first point is the first principle a competent person is required to, uh, with the skills, um, to uh, perform the specific tasks of completing, reviewing the calculations. And what they're saying is that this is something that you obtain through training, qualifications, experience, or a combination thereof. Now, the folks doing this for us in the district are trained ecologists. We've currently got two of them, two full-time ecologists, another one within the city of Cambridge, and we are in the process of um, uh, recruiting for yet another, partly because uh, the council, um, its members, its officers take this very, very seriously. We've got to get this right. Uh, we've got to ensure uh, that we don't um, allow development to uh, um, damage our, our biodiversity out there in the district. And so we're, we're really doing all we can to ensure that we've got the resources in place to make this make this work. Um, a little bit now on how it works. So measuring biodiversity net gain, we need to measure a couple of different things. We need to measure the baseline. So what is there? The baseline is the condition of the site before any development takes place. That's the baseline. Um, and we're looking for uh, enhancements and calculations of habitat creation after that development takes place. And that could be either on site, off site, or a combination of on and off-site. We're essentially looking for area units, hedgerow units, and in some instance, watercourse units, although watercourses will be probably rarer. Uh, these three types will be assessed independently within the metric, and uh, each will need to show at least a 10% increase as per the Environment Act. So 10% is the new mandatory figure. Now, I say that, but um, having a, a chat with one of you this morning actually i did have to point out that um at the moment 10 percent mandatory biodiversity net gain is for major developments only the minor developments is coming on board on the 2nd of april so next week uh, so up until that time it's just it's just majors going forward it will be minors and then next year um, it will be nsips as well so it's all heading in the same direction um, OK, so we have your baseline and then we have your post development creation or enhancement of biodiversity. All of these things need to be measured using the biodiversity metric. And just an example here to give you a sense of how complicated it can be. 
for woodland habitat, for instance, there are 13 different condition criteria, uh, which I've listed along the uh, left hand edge of the screen there, just for woodland habitat. Each one of these criteria will have a score. That score will be assessed by a competent person, an ecologist. That score will go into the metric and the metric will spit out something, hopefully, that makes sense um, and aggregate those scores into biodiversity units. And I must say that this is where, you know, there's a little bit of alchemy involved here. I don't fully understand how this works in, in the unit. It's taken a PhD at DEFRA to build this thing and uh, we have confidence that they've got it right, but it's not, this, this is the reason that it's not something that um, we would encourage ordinary Joes to just um, pick up and start messing around with. You, you really need to know what you're doing. You need to have the training. You need to have ecological training and understand what's going on before you start playing around with this thing. Um, so, OK, talking about units. As an example, units are calculated as area multiplied by distinctiveness multiplied by condition, multiplied by strategic significance. So all of those things, it's it's almost like baking a cake. They're the, they're the ingredients. They'll go into the mix, into that defrometric, that will bake the cake and it will spit out something that will tell us that, okay, in this instance, it's four units, for instance. And those four units, whether that's something we're talking about as a baseline condition, so existing habitat, or whether that's um, uh, host development that's needed to be replaced, it's the same tool that's doing that job. The same tool that's telling us that's what's there before development takes place, that's what's lost by development, and therefore that's what's needed to be replaced, either on site, off site, or combination. I, I, I'm trying to think if there's an easier way to explain that, but maybe we can get to it in, no, in questions. Um, so, OK, so. Outcomes, the output from uh, the, the measurements that our colleges put in and the local district ecologists um, in the planning team will check that output. Um, they'll check the metric for uh, the metric does have flags. I mean, it, it, you know, it verifies stuff as it goes in. You can't just put nonsense in and, you know, fingers crossed it will be fine. It will verify. Um, in addition to the metric verification, we have just purchased some software um, from a company who have built a system that does even more checks uh, to ensure that um, things like trading rules have not been, uh, you know, circumvented. So we're doing our best to ensure we have competent staff, we've got the systems we need in place to, 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 to make sure that what's put in is, is not rubbish. And so from that, our, our ecologists will review, you know, is the project exempt from BNG? Has the correct metric been used? I won't go through and read this um, ad infinitum, but you can get a sense of, you know, these are the kinds of tasks that our ecologists will be undertaking. Yeah, there's more as well. There we go. Red flags, orange flags, you know, user errors, all of these things need to be resolved. And um, this is before it gets to the planning committee, um, you know. <laughs> the, the, so we really have to ensure that the quality of the information coming from the developers, ecologists has been checked and is is good to go. Um, just a little bit on trading rules. Um, so trading rules in BNG, um, you can't down trade, you can't substitute a high priority habitat, for instance, for a lower quality habitat where there's more of it. You know, there are very, very tight trading rules built into the system to ensure that we, you know, we're not being hoodwinked by, uh, you know, we're losing a particularly important piece of habitat over here. Oh, but guess what? Over here, we're going to give, you know, acres and acres of grassland that scores um, lower on the metric. So the very important trading rules um, are in the system and they're flagged. Uh, the metric flags any errors with red boxes um, where trading rules have not been met with habitat distinctiveness, for instance. There are some exemptions to biodiversity net gain, um, just a few. I'll go through them. So permitted development, urgent crown development, uh, sites exclusively sealed for BNG score zero, um, impact uh, or impacting habitat in an area below de minimis, which is uh, 25 meters squared or five meters of, of linear habitats, householder applications, small scale self-build, custom build, 
and biodiversity net gain sites uh, enhanced for wildlife. And then just a brief reminder that we can deliver um, biodiversity net gain on site, we can deliver it off site, or we can deliver it in a combination of those three. What's happening in South Cambridge at the moment is, well, it's happening all over England actually, is habitat banks are being set up for off-site delivery. And the, the reason for this um, is that what we've found, talking to our ecologists and talking to other ecologists in other parts of the country, the smaller your development is, the, the less likely you are to be able to deliver your net gain entirely on, on site. It just doesn't stack up. And so when you've got very small developments of just a few homes um, or, or, or small areas of land which have been developed, um, it just it becomes yeah. unviable for developers to put their net gain on site. It therefore goes off site to a strategic habitat bank and becomes part of a larger uh, strategic offering, which can then in in time. In time, give us some additional local wildlife sites. And this is how it works. The first year you strip the arable, wildlife habitats planted, and then as you go on over time, year 10, you get this establishment of uh, better, better wildlife habitats. Um, just John, a couple. John, I'm just yeah. conscious of time. It's, so it's coming up to half past now. Oh, gosh. So I, th I think that's 25 minutes. So and Already? there's a lot of questions coming no. in. So. OK. Okay, how, well, how close are we to the to the end? <laughs> to the end, um, I well, really, I mean, I, I was just going to talk briefly about the nature network, but we can skip that. We can go over that. Um, that's a little bit about what BNG is going to add, um, and then just my final two slides, really. So, um, fantastic opportunity, developers to deliver higher quality GI and urban settings, etc. Um, and then LPAs bring online, you know, it's it's just really explaining what we're doing. But I think the last point and the important point to make here um, is that we we want to work with the parishes. And if there's something that the ecology team can do to get you, I don't know, better quality information in a more um, timely manner to help you make your decisions, let's do that. That's all I've got for you. How's that? Wonderful. Thank you, John. I'm going to start the questions now and I'll go through the chat. We did okay. have um, just to say we will share the presentations and obviously this is being recorded and the recording will be shared as well. Um, so there was a question from Kirsten Rayner from Gamlingay Parish Council that she submitted in advance. Yes, I think that might have been answered, but yes. I'm just asking if not, there's an opportunity to to ask it. Kirsten, I know you're on the call. Um, we talked just earlier. One, sure. one, yeah. one, one thing from me was uh, NSIP. You mentioned NSIP, John. Oh, sorry. So for those who don't <laughs> aren't aware, NSIP is a nat nationally strategic strategic infrastructure infrastructure project it's a sub, sub project yes <laughs> yeah good, good so point just, sorry just to say um <laughs> that's what that acronym stands for so kirsten do you want to just ask your question and i think people might find it helpful it might be a different question now because of um <laughs> i've recently talked to john this morning about um the answer to it so i'm sorry it might be a slightly different question that you're expecting but um ah. just to clarify um you're saying that the base data that you use is from 2020 and that's that's all for all sites that's the base data that you use can you just clarify no. where you get your data from and from what date well that that's not entirely correct no the, the, so the way that it would work typically is that if a site is um being developed we will have, um, well, the developer will employ an ecologist to assess the biodiversity on the site prior to any kind of land clearance. That's that's how it's assessed. But what we understand to be the case is that there are some naughty people out there. What they'll do is they'll clear the land and then they'll say, oh, look, there's nothing to see here. Now, if that's the case and it comes to us, um, according to the Environment Act, we will assess the site as it was on the 30th of January 2020. So that's that's a provision that anticipates that some developers will try to do that prior land clearance and they're not going to get away with it. It's in the Environment Act, it's already covered. And the way that we would do that is we would use a combination of air photography, um, any data from the parish, any local pictures, put that all together and have our ecologists assess the value of that site. 
and we'd assess it conservatively in a way that you know ensures that we're not losing anything uh, or that we're, we're you know we're, we're covering our bases that's how that works super that's very helpful thank you no and problem. the other the other question was about the um um so you did mention about sites sealed sites don't actually have to sealed surface sites is that something where there's contamination can you just explain what you mean by that sorry Concrete, um, anything where you have zero biodiversity, um, I mean, you might have some grass growing between some cracks, but you, you know, that's what we mean by sealed sites. Um, yeah, and anywhere where you just, it, it's a, perhaps it's a former industrial site, there is nothing to see. Um, or, or tarmac? Tarmac, yeah, absolutely. Any, any you know, anything that's uh, a non-permeable surface for which you would not expect to see any kind of biodiversity will score zero in the metric. Lovely, thank you very much, thanks. Um, so I think David Reeves asked a question, how do you prove BNG has taken place and how long will it be monitored for and by whom? So I think you've... Yep, 30 years. That. Yeah. So 30 years, that, um, uh, so briefly, sorry, I'm aware of time. Um, so it's monitored by the local planning authority. So that's why we have the ecologists we do to undertake that monitoring annually. Um, any problems um, with that monitoring uh, that we find we we would go back to the provider and we'd say you know what this is not as it is meant to be um and they would have to either replant or mitigate in some other way so we, we have a central function that's why we need a strong uh, competent team of ecologists um to ensure that you know what we're being told is happening on these sites is actually taking place and it's monitored yet over 30 years uh, thank you um and then we have um sharon um and i think this question do you sharon do you want to ask a question uh yeah i mean our parish is going to be affected by the east west rail if it goes ahead so who monitors that although i think that might be what you were calling an end then yep yep i mean definitely because it's going to have a massive impact on biodiversity in southern cambridge and you know who who's going to enforce the ten percent? Well, currently NSIPs aren't covered under uh, the ten percent mandate. Uh, as I said earlier, uh, NSIPs will come in in twenty twenty five. However, what we are finding is, you know, not not oh, okay. not every. So, sorry. So if it's coming in, so at the moment they're only at the statutory consultation. Well, they're not even at that yet. Yep. So by the time, assuming it goes ahead then it may well be covered if it's coming in by 2025. Yeah, so a couple of things to say. One is that with linear sites, uh, they're very different from uh, housing developments. When you've got a linear site, you've got an impact, which is very thin and long and stretches across you know, vast areas. Um, and so it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a bit more tricky because how do you mitigate for that along the entire length? Um, what we find in those instances is it's it's best to take the mitigation, to collect up all of that mitigation, and to put it on in you know in one habitat bank, um, as well as obviously doing what what we can along the route of the site. But um, because it's 2025, it's an NSIP. It's it's just not it's not currently covered. What I would say that's positive is that we do know that working with some developers, um, they they want to play ball. They absolutely want to do the best, and uh, they won't always go by the book. They'll go above and beyond when it comes to biodiversity in that game. We might well see that with East West Rail. I doubt it. Somehow, based on their current, um, uh, yeah, based okay. on their current sort of uh, setup. No. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Um, and I think Toomey has made a comment. It's not at the stage yet when it will go ahead and it's likely to be covered, as we've said. So that's fine. Um, I think we'll take one more question um, in the chat, which is Anna. Then we do need to move on because we have got a number of other presentations sorry. tonight. <laughs> I'm sorry, Johnny. It's always very interesting when you come and talk to us. What we will do is John will um, respond to the questions separately. Yes. Um, we will respond. Um, we, uh, Bev, our lovely Bev, will make sure that you all get um, copies and answers to the questions as well as the copy of the presentation. So I'll just take the last question, which is from Anna. Uh, Anna Bradman, do you want to talk? You've asked about calculations to be backed up out by site assessment. 
Yes, uh, I just um, asked, will the calculations be backed up by site assessment? Because the maths or the algorithm, as you said, might imply more improvement than actually happens on the ground. I'm mindful that the role of an ecologist used to be very much boots on the ground and area mapping is. and assessment. Still um, is. Whereas this metric looks very desk based. I'm sure no. our ecologists are highly qualified in yep. this regard. <laughs> Anna, um, Councillor Bradham, um, I, I, I think what we're doing is we are providing site visits uh, for all of these. I mean, you know, it's absolutely in the model that we have boots on the ground. We can't do stuff from space. There are people that tell us that we can. Um, you can do certain amounts with remote sensing. Absolutely, it's possible. But what we're talking about when we get down to habitat levels, condition, you no, know, our ecologists are out there on the ground visiting, you know, pens and paper, rain and wind <laughs> that's what we're doing i can assure you of that that we're not circumventing we're not shortcutting that's why we need the team that we have thank you john that's really helpful and thank for your presentation i think no everybody problem. really really enjoyed it um i certainly did um and uh we will make sure as we said we'll circulate the slides as well as the as the recording so I'm going to quickly hand over to Lee Hillam because he's patiently waiting. So this is another really interesting area for me about um, awarded uh, water courses. So uh, over to you, Lee. It'd be fantastic if you can give us an update. Thank you, Heather. I'll just try and share my screen. We could see. Brilliant. OK, I can't see you, so sorry about that. So um, awarded water courses. Um, I did think that I would turn up and talk uh, to people and probably they wouldn't know much about awarded water courses, but I can actually see by the uh, attendees list that actually I know many people who know things about awarded water courses and actually a few people know probably a little bit more than me. Um, if you're not familiar with awarded water courses, um, there's one on this first slide here, and I think I can see someone on the call who, who will know where that is. Um, and that is our awarded water course in Fendrayton. Um, so I'll just move on. So what is an awarded drain? Um, I think when I spoke to Heather and the planning department about awarded water courses, um, they were equally interested about what an award drain was and about its importance and at that time we was talking about you know planning concerns and considerations to do with checking and planning applications and whatnot so uh, an awarded drain uh, is an historic uh, it's a historic thing uh, and uh, what we're talking about is uh, drainage ditches culverts and uh, the conveyances of water if you like um, they were awarded, so the term award comes from the Early Enclosures Acts. Um, and historically, awarded water courses were, and still are actually, really important uh, drainage channels. So they would have been important in the 1800s when they were awarded for, uh, mainly for agriculture and things like that. So a main drainage channel through a parish or through um, an area whereby people relied on that water course to drain the land so that they could grow food. Um, there are many uh, awarded water courses around. South Cams have um, probably got the most awarded water courses and uh, we've got 275 kilometres of them um, and we have an in-house awarded water course team. Lee, so, can I just, sorry to interrupt, yeah. can I just point out that, am I right in thinking that awarded means it was awarded to a particular body to look after it? That's correct, Anna, yes. So the term awarded um, means exactly what you've just said. Uh, the commissioners of the day, who were the people who were relied on uh, in the community to make sure that things happened, awarded these ditches so that's where the, the term comes from awarded them to certain people and if you look in the awards uh, documentations that are held at the archive you will see that they are referred to as the public drains so they're not always awarded to the district councils um that's a quite a um 
people tend to think that when they see the term awarded water course, they're awarded always awarded to the to the councils, and they and that's not the case. So they can be awarded to the allotment holders, which are people who own the land. So um, the council does have a statutory obligation to maintain the awarded water courses, and uh, there have been legal cases over the years um, whereby people who have had drainage channels awarded to them have challenged those awards to say that they didn't believe that they were relevant nowadays uh, and whatnot. Um, I, I suppose the most recent case would have been with St Ives uh, Rural District Council in 1960, um, where they challenged the term uh, awarded and uh, it went to court and it was deemed that the term in the award documents uh, of surveyor of highways meant the district council. Um, so there are many legal cases. For South Cam's awarded water courses, there are also a set of land drainage bylaws, uh, which are really important because uh, the bylaws are oh, something thanks, thanks. that um, the bylaws are something that people have to follow for things like uh, ensuring that buildings and structures are not put too close to uh, a water course. Um, the basic of planning is that the, the planning authority uh, and the LLFA do the check-in. So when a plan submitted, uh, the county council do ordinary water course consents and then a consent is required for an awarded water course um, from South Cairns District Council. Um, to make sure that all of the considerations for the award are are covered. And the main consideration really is uh, for the award is to make sure that the channel is viable. So uh, a, a planner will look and do the check in. Uh, or the LLFA will. The ordinary water course consent covers things like if you're planning to do any works on a water course, such as installing a bridge or installing a culvert. Uh, or installing a head wall. So those are the considerations for an ordinary water course consent. And then the bylaw consent from South Cambridgeshire District Council covers things like the distance that you're putting things from the water course because we have to be able to maintain it and its viability going forwards. So that's quite an important part because what tends to happen is um, a developer will get permission to make a connection and uh, everyone will assume because of attenuation and and so on that the water course is fit to take the water down the channel um, but of course the water course has to be maintained correctly uh, and the correct um, the correct maintenance has to be applied to ensure that the connection that the developer is making um, is is viable and it's draining properly and so on so the bylaw consent is something that I like to promote uh, greatly because it's sometimes the bit that gets missed off. So, we're, but we're working on um, working on that with the LLFA and with the planning authority. So, another misconception is um, riparian responsibilities. So, some people believe that when awarded water courses, um, or if awarded, if they have an awarded water course um, adjacent or about in their property. Um, that everything to do with that water course is um, the award holder's duty, um, and that's not the case. So if you are an, uh, if you have an awarded water course um, near to your property, um, it doesn't mean that the council or the award holder owns the water course. Um, they are more likely just to, just to maintain it. So there are riparian responsibilities. If you're not familiar with uh, riparian responsibilities that the, the word riparian just means that um, the bank owner, if you like, owns the water course. Uh, another misconception is uh, with with water courses and it catches people out is that whereby uh, a water course is adjacent to your property, even when it's on the outside of your fence line and it's not mentioned in your deeds, um, you are still classed uh, in law as being the owner of that water course uh, unless your deeds say otherwise. Um, so quite often or not people will live um, with a water course on the outside of their fence line and it may uh, they may have the highway on the on the other side of that ditch as well and people will quite often live um, in, a, in a property for 
20 years or more uh, and not realise that that ditch is actually belongs to them um, and it's not a highway consideration. So um, the term for responsibilities for highways, ditches, is usually that if the ditch only takes highways water, then it's, a, it's more likely to be a highways responsibility. But most of them are riparian owned by the nearest landowner. So um, just moving on quickly, just before we leave this slide, this was a picture that I got from the Association of Drainage Authorities, which showed um, what I believe to be um, earlier ward maintenance. And in fact, as you can see by that box in the background, there's a small hatchback car there. So it's not quite uh, as old as I thought, but um, a good picture there of uh, a earlier or ward maintenance uh, in action. So if, you do, if you've never seen an awarded watercourse document, um, this is uh, Histon's award documents um, that we still refer to today. So um, most parishes will have uh, an enclosures uh, document book. You can see there um, going back to 1809 and an enclosures map as well. And this is where the awards are written down. So if you ever you want to see uh, or need any information on the awards, you can visit the, Ar the archivists in Ely and ask to see your parish award book uh, and it will tell you all about um, the awards and many other things to do with uh, responsibilities. Uh, as I said before, uh, duties are placed on uh, parishes and the surveyor of highways, which uh, the surveyor of highways has been determined as the district council, which you can see there in the second bullet point. Just move on. Um, here you can see some uh, South Cams District Council nowadays use tractors, flails and um, excavators to maintain the watercourses. Um, not probably in keeping with what John said regarding ecology and habitats and stuff like that, large machines like this um, are not always favourable, um, but South Cam's awarded watercourses are very diverse. So if you go towards the north of the district, you'll see typically their um, very honed, deep watercourses that take water out to the river. And if you move into the south uh, of the South Cam's area, you'll see uh, quite often or not um, spring fed watercourses. Um, often chalk streams um, and very precious habitats you know, out that part of the district in the south of the district, um, all of which need to be maintained very sensitively and very differently. So we don't have uh, a one shot approach to maintaining watercourses. Um, some of them are really important habitats and we work with um, colleagues um, in the Wild Trout Trust and other nature uh, organisations to make sure that we maintain the watercourse appropriately to um, to where it is and what it and what habitats it's got in. So this is the watercourse team. Mount South Cams have got uh, uh, their own watercourse team, so we don't use uh, contractors. Uh, the watercourse team are um, on call twenty four hours a day, every day of the year. Um, and they will um, they will be maintaining watercourses all over South Cams. You'll, you may have seen our uh, Blue New Holland tractors and we've got several excavators and a few four by fours uh, and whatnot. So those are the watercourse team. So as I said before, 275 kilometres of wa awarded watercourse. Um, we carry out lots of repairs to uh, our watercourse infrastructure. At the moment, we've got about 10 or 11 outstanding repairs, which um, is damage that's been caused by the um, many winter storms that we've had this year. So we're just turning into the phase now um, where we start to shift from maintenance into repairs coming into the summer. Um, we also look after the Webb's Hole uh, Sluice Pumping Station, which uh, serves around 13,000 households in South Cambridgeshire, um, mainly from Camborne, Bar Hill, Uttons Drove, the water that comes down that part of the catchment. 
And in the bottom left hand corner, you can see what that pumping station looks like. So that's uh, an important infrastructure. And we also provide flood protection for the vulnerable as well. So the teams will uh, are on call, as I've said before, for flood protection and uh, the delivering of sandbags for the vulnerable um, as well. So all of that service is provided uh, for around about £444,000. So if you've not seen an award map uh, before uh, or are not aware of uh, awarded water courses, as you can see on here, this is our um, GIS layer, uh, which is on the council's network. And there you'll see um, a few popular areas for drainage, um, be it Swavesey, uh, North Stowe and Willingham, and obviously all of the blue lines are awarded watercourses. So um, you'll notice a few strange things probably from that map that not all of the watercourses are joined up. There are um, odd little sections where there might be half a mile of watercourse and then nothing connected either side. Um, and when the award channels were awarded by the commissioners of the day, that would have taken into account that there were lots of other responsibilities for water courses as well. So you will have um, internal drainage board responsibilities, you'll have um, main river responsibilities and so on, and they all tie together. So um, awarded water courses are not uh, necessarily end to end water courses. They, they're, they're often little bits and pieces that were deemed as being really important at the time that the commissioners, commissioners awarded them. So for us, the watercourse service, uh, seasonal, we do seasonal cutting uh, and maintenance, which is our annual maintenance um, from late July to mid-March. Obviously, that takes into account um, ecology um, with respect to the bird, birds nesting and, um, and other considerations uh, like that. Um, the works that we carry out typically are flail mowing, desilting, weeding and handworks. We operate very similar to an internal drainage board. And then, as I said before, we carry out uh, just coming into the repair period down mid-March to late June. Um, our awarded water courses are categorised A to D, um, and A requires um, probably multiple maintenance visits um, down to D, which is next to no uh, interaction at all. Um, that will obviously sound quite odd because these are important channels. But some channels are um, only like 100 metres in the middle of a in the middle of a farmer's field. They're not connected to anything nowadays, and and so on. So those ones uh, are sort of where what, what fall into the D category. A's are obvious; they need lots of uh, attention. That's really important because for development, we need to make sure that people apply for a bylaw consent, and we keep our eye on on planning and development because what we don't want to do is someone to connect to one of our channels that is categorised lower down. Um, we need to make sure that we continually review and uh, match the maintenance with what's required. So uh, I spoke about ecology considerations and partnership working before with the Wild Trout Trust and so on. And I've also said about developments. Um, so that's that. Uh, uh, that's an example of one of our larger channels, again, um, Coville's drain in Swavesey. So um, over the winter storm periods, uh, the banks quite often slip uh, or require maintenance. And there on the left, you can see um, some of you uh, recognise the side view of Patrick Matthews, who was my predecessor. Um, and uh, that's Binbrook slip there on the left hand side and Coville's drain on the right. So I respect that drainage is often a really uh, convoluted and difficult subject to deal with. Um, this was a presentation that was put together much longer for members um, that I did do in the chamber. Um, but there's some good contacts there for drainage uh, issues. Um, sewerage obviously falls to Anglia Water, highways to uh, Cambridgeshire County Council. The water courses, if you like, i.e. riparian considerations go to Cambridgeshire County Council flood and water team. 
Um, also very important to report flooding of land and property to them because they investigate and carry out um, and, and write a report on it um, to uh, conclude their findings of any investigations. And then, of course, anything awarded uh, will, of course, comes to me. So I think that, that is it. Oh, that's wonderful, Lee. It was really, really interesting. Thank you for that. Um, good, good to hear it. And uh, again, we will share the presentation. So um, you're still sharing your screen if you want to stop. That would be great. Um, so we've got an opportunity, I think, for um, questions. Um, I think there are some really positive comments about you and your team and the brilliant work that you do and you've done in uh, Swayze. So thank you. Um, and uh, lots, lots of really good and positive comments there. I think the only one, um, I, I don't know if there's any actual questions for you directly. Um, just trying to look down, to be honest. Uh, da -da. So there was yes, uh, Councillor Carla Hoffman, but that's about Marley, but she'll talk to you offline on that. Then yeah. there is one. Um, is the stream... I think you said something. Is there a stream and awarded water course? That's what needs to be established That's, first. No, that was in response to somebody okay. complaining about um, talk uh, stream. Uh, yeah. Talk stream, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, Martin has a question. Um, where can we get a copy of our local water course map and the ownership? Yeah, so um, the County Council are responsible for all ordinary, all ordinary water courses. And what's meant by that term is that anything that's not main river. Um, they've been doing a lot of work over the last 18 months because there are lots of drainage responsibilities. And um, I believe in the next week or two, they are just ready to publish an online water course identification kit. And what that will mean is, is that all partners, including South Cams, have inputted their watercourse information into one place. So anybody, members of the public um, and so on, will be able to go on to the Lead Local Flood Authority's website and identify every watercourse as being either riparian, IDB, awarded or whatnot. So um, the important place to look for that information, because there's no link available at the moment, but there will be uh, Hillary from the LLFA has informed me that there will be. If you go, um, just type into Google Cambridgeshire County Council flood and water team, it will bring up their website um, and you can follow links there to very easily um, to water course information. That's brilliant. Thank you, Lee. And, and, um, and, li and likewise, if any if anybody does want the awarded watercourse information, I am obviously the keeper of that, so I can give you a map of your parish if you if you want that. So that's what I was going to ask, Lee. If we can get a map of the awarded watercourses in a parish, that's great. If we can come to you, yeah, that's no problem at all. Just um, send me an email, and I can do you a snip um, and uh, and send it back to you. Uh, and I think someone else has just mentioned that what you just meant, what you've talked through there about that system early um, and, the, and that sounds really positive, really great. And, and they'd be keen to have the link so we can make sure we'll send the link when that that's in place. OK, um, and Toomey's just put a link in as well. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, OK, so. Thank you very much, Lee. It was really very interesting. Again, uh, another really interesting presentation. So thank you for for um, joining us tonight. We really appreciate that. Um, OK, you're very welcome to stay till the end, but we appreciate if you need to go, that's fine. Um, I'm just going to swap you. the agenda slightly and ask Nicole to come in because she's only got a effectively f a five minute update. So, Nicole, if you're there, if you want to just do your quick update and then we'll um, allow you to 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 uh, sign off. Um, thank you for being patient. And then um, we've got our own team, John and Nancy, to do about water. So, OK, thank you. I'm just getting the right link. Um, here it is. I'll share my screen. So, um, 
some of you may know, some of you might not know, but we are currently um, redesigning the South Cam's website and the Greater Cambridge Shed Planning website. Um, and what I just wanted to show you today is a really quick overview on a first draft of what the Greater Cambridge Shared Planning website will look like and there will be more opportunities for you to feed in um, when we've got further down the process um, but if you do have any feedback or you have any kind of things that really frustrate you with the Greater Cambridge Shared Planning website at the moment please feel free to email me and we can make sure that all of that feedback is taken on board as part of the redesign process but I'm just going to share my screen and show you the first draft now and I'm happy to have any feedback now or alternatively feel free to email me um, after this meeting. So this is the proposal for Greater Cambridge Shed Planning so I'll talk you through the home page and the different elements that are on the home page now. So one of the big things that we're doing and we're doing this on the main South Cam's website as well is we are creating sections um, for the different user groups that might come to our website. So we have residents, businesses and developers in the top navigation bar here um, and you will also see we've got accessibility tools and careers. So accessibility tools will be um, like a translation service It will enable users to um, magnify the website, it will enable them to use a screen reader and do anything, change the colour contrast and do all of those things. Um, residents, business and developers kind of says exactly what it is on the tin. If you click on the residents section, you'll see all information relevant <coughs> to residents. If you select the business section, you'll see all information relevant to businesses and so on. So we're looking at the residents tab at the moment. The other two tabs will follow the same kind of layout. Um, so as you can see, we've got view, apply, report and book, and they will essentially be the hub of your links of your self-service opportunities. So, for example, view under there, you will have view and comment on a planning application. Apply, you might have apply for planning permission. Report, you might have kind of report a breach of planning compliance and a book. You might have book a pre-app appointment or book a HSBA appointment or something like that. As we move further down the page, we've got a what is called a hero section. Um, so at the moment, it's really hard to probably tell what this content is going to be because it's just filler content. But these will be customizable. And these will be based upon the top calls that are coming into the contact center um, or the top searches that people are doing on Google. So, um, for example, it might be householder and small business advice. It might be local plan. It might be um, the planning application process, what have you. Um, so we can customise that. And that is just hopefully to push people to find the content quicker than needing to phone us, email us or do any of those kind of things. Then we've got In My Area. Um, so the In My Area will be um, providing localised information to our residents or developers or whomever comes to our website, dependent on their location. So that will tell residents any planning applications that are in and around their area. It will also explain whether you're kind of in a conservation area, what your property constraints are, any tree preservation orders around you or anything like that. So that's just going to provide them with some quick information on the first home page of the website if they enter their postcode to save them going through the website and struggling to find that information. Underneath you've got our services, so then that's kind of like the main hub of the website. So what is it that um, people might come to our website for. So as you can see, we've kind of got check if I need planning permission, the planning application process, planning compliance and so on. Um, and underneath those sections, that's where you'll get to your main content pages. Um, and as you can see, we've got 12 and I think we've covered pretty much everything from a resident's perspective um, that they might need. As we scroll down a little bit more, we've then got latest news. Um, so there'll be like your press releases, they'll be related to planning specifically. And then on the right hand side, you've got events and committee meetings. So they will be um, any events that the planning service are holding. We'll be able to add those in ourselves and it will also talk to modern.gov to feed through any um, planning committees or any committees that are relevant to plan the planning service. Finally, at the bottom, you've got about planning. So that is all of the sort of videos that the planning service are creating, um, helpful tips and uh, tricks to kind of help you with your planning application or with anything that might happen within the planning service. So that will be a link essentially to our YouTube um, where we have a planning playlist. So there's still more videos being created at the moment. 
but that just gives you a little bit of a taste as to what that section will be um and that's it really that's the website that's the home page we haven't got any further than the home page thank you nicole that's really really helpful um i'm just going to say there was a lot to take in there so this is a really early draft that you're seeing. So it still has to go through all of the development and everything else. But this is kind of the principles and it will look very similar to the South Cam's website. So we wanted to make it the same, um, you know, kind of template, if you like. So we're, we're um, using the same template. But what we're trying to do is really hone in on those big um, high traffic points where members of the public are asking, um, you know, and, and and trying to get information or what do they use the website for? So it'd be really helpful in your own parishes if you can feed back to Nicole any of those kind of points that you think, oh, we would be really great to have this, you know, prominent on the website or this is the this is the really you know, the one thing I keep using the website for, those sorts of things are really helpful for us to know. So we'd really appreciate if you could feed that back separately to Nicole and we will put her um, email um, address in our uh, notes. Um, Anna, can I bring you in, Councillor yeah. Anna Brabham? So, so just a real quick thing for Nicole on that one. Um, you know, the top tabs across the top of the page for resident business council, they might be meaningful to planners, but when you're an ordinary Joe blogs, you don't know whether your query fits under a resident, a business or council. So I just um, just want you to think about the naming of those tabs, because unless you know where to look, you don't know where to look. Um, but the second thing is something much more important than that, I think. Um, in times gone by, district council used to share its asset mapping with the county council. So it was displayed on the public asset layer of the county council mapping. And then they stopped doing it because they didn't want to be responsible for updating the public asset mapping, um, which is a, such a disadvantage because it used to show what assets were in the ownership of either the county council or the district council or the city council uh, and that was extremely useful i've put a, a description in the chat so if you wanted to respond separately that would be fine okay thank you i haven't read that oh yeah just looking at it now thank you I queried it with county and they said they didn't want to be responsible for updating the data, but you must be updating your data all the time. So it would just be really helpful if you could share that data with county so that that mapping layer can be maintained on county mapping. I think that's something we'll probably need to take offline, um, um, Anna, but I, I agree. I think there is something about us working together and how and what does that look like? Because the, the data will be updated. It's just there might be liabilities that they see by, you know, presenting it on their website as well. And that's something we'll need to take take yes, offline. But, but I don't so, think yeah. it's but the point is, I don't think it's um, presented anywhere else. So actually, I can still see county assets on the mapping but i can't see where district council owns land which is really useful as a you know district council yeah yep okay we'll take that back and we'll see we have multiple layers i think it's just understanding what we need to show really so thank you thank you very much nicole for your patience and uh yeah we'll leave you go now and we'll call our last presenters sorry uh john and nancy i took chair's privilege there i'm so sorry about that and and slip nicole in but hopefully um uh, that's okay with you both and um over to you so bear with me i just sort my screens out uh yeah i'm john dixon so i lead the the policy team and we're working on the new local plan but today uh i'm going to talk to you about water supply because it's become a huge issue uh over the last uh 12 months really for my team and there's an awful lot going on and actually awful lot has happened on the issue in the last couple of months so i'll run through an update of what's changed and i'll then give you an update of a report uh, that we took to uh, council members um, a couple of weeks ago on our local plan timetable. So, um, well, we are obviously not uh, the body responsible for planning for water supply. 
Um, there's a range of bodies involved, including the Environment Agency, but our water company covering the entire of Cambridge and South Cambridgeshire is Cambridge Water, and they are responsible for producing a water resources management plan. Uh, but above that, there is now a regional water planning process where uh, Water Resources East uh, produce a water resources plan uh, for the whole region covering the period up to 2050. Um, and the regional plan really shows the problems that are coming up, not just around Cambridge, but actually uh, at regional level, but also over much of the UK. Um, these are some extracts from the regional plan, which you can find on the, the Water Resources website. But what it really shows is that uh, they've explored the water needs of the region uh, up to 2050 and identified that actually when you look at the amount of water needed, there's significant deficits in terms of the demand versus the supply. Um, the whole region has been classified as an area of being seriously water stressed. Um, an awful lot of our water bodies, bodies are falling short of the um, good ecological status. Um, climate change has very much been documented as starting to having an effect on our you know, weather patterns and the availability of water resources. But in our particular area, we've also got the chalk streams, the incredibly rare habitats that uh, need a high degree of uh, protection. So really, the re at the regional level and the local level, water companies are grappling with a whole list of issues. The chart on the right of that slide really shows the problem. So the blue line running along the top is effectively a do nothing option. So the demand would gradually creep up over the period to 2050, um, which then leads to that deficit. Um, the, what is it, purpley coloured line below that starts to show what you could do through managing demand. So can you reduce leakage? Can you make usage of the water more efficient? But the line at the bottom, the sort of oh, orangey line, um, shows actually we need to do more than that. We need to be reducing uh, the amount of water that we abstract from the environment in order to protect those, um, protect the wildlife and protect the quality of water courses. So what that shows is uh, the need to have a sort of stepped approach to reducing the amount of abstraction. So there's a huge issue to deal with across the region. And the regional plan really starts to put together the response to that. Um, in in the Cambridge area, the biggest interventions for us are in 2032, there'll be a, a water pipe connecting us to Grafham Water and the North so that Cambridge can start to benefit from water resources across a much wider area. Because historically, Cambridge has abstracted its water from the chalk and hasn't been really connected to the wider network. There's also proposals uh, in the mid 2030s to bring forward a Fens reservoir, which would start to capture more of the water before it is then taken out to the, the North Sea and therefore enable that water to be used um, really instead of taking it from the chalk aquifer that we currently do at the moment. So there are major infrastructure plans in place to bring forward supply. So. You've probably heard as well or seen in the papers, there's been some issues around uh, the very short term. So before that pipeline is connected, um, where um, the Environment Agency have objected to a number of applications, planning applications for sites, they're actually already in our adopted local plans. Um, so coming back to the Cambridge Water Management Plan, this is the key document really that's going to look at, at those issues and um, the new plans got to grapple with all those issues that I mentioned. Um, they published their original plan uh, around a year ago, but it was subject to uh, objections by the Environment HC. Uh, and DEFRA have asked them to um, revise it and now they're on to their second revision. So, a new version was published about a month ago, 
and we now wait to see what happens because it can only be adopted and finalised when it's approved by DEFRA. But the issue we've been grappling really is how to deal with that period uh, before 2032 when the new uh, strategic connections come on stream. And that's really caused by the EA seeking reductions in abstraction in order to protect the quality of our watercourses. So when this issue really came to light, um, obviously it caused great concern because it's affecting how we can meet the needs for homes and jobs of our population. So our, our leadership, council leadership, uh, very much wrote to government saying that action needed to be taken to resolve these issues. And I guess one of the major uh, responses to that was uh, in July last year, the establishment of the uh, Water Scarcity Group. And that really brings together all the key stakeholders with an interest in um, water supply issues. So uh, DLUC, DEFRA, the Environment Agency, uh, Offwat, Water Resources East, the water companies, the councils, all coming together to take action to resolve these short and long-term issues uh, really responding to the importance of the issue and the importance of Cambridge to the nation, really. Um, it's being chaired by Dr. Paul Lenster, who is a uh, Water Resources East independent chair. And uh, the government have now committed around nine million pounds in total towards supporting its work. Um, in December, we had further updates through a written ministerial statement by Michael Gove. Um, they announced that they would be reviewing uh, building regulations uh, with, uh, I think, a consultation coming out soon, um, really setting out measures that will allow councils to require much more efficient um, standards for new development. And in the meantime, they made quite a significant announcement in the fact that they would support councils requiring greater efficiency from uh, planning applications where the water issue was holding up development. So previously it had been very difficult for councils to go beyond what was in the standard building regulations, um, but this was quite a change. So we are already um, in planning applications pursuing and achieving um, water efficiency standards below the building regulations, um, which, is, which is really good for um, saving water. Um, things have moved on again um, with a series of statements accompanying the UK budget um, about again a couple of, well, about three weeks ago. Um, so as well as the case for Cambridge, which is around um, looking at the government's uh, Cambridge 2040 aspirations, which did to an extent address water issues, there was two other documents published um, one was a joint statement um, setting out the commitment of the councils, the government and those water uh, stakeholders uh, to resolving the short term issues around Cambridge regarding water. And the other one was an update on the work of the water scarcity group going through all the measures they're exploring, both looking at water supply uh, and reducing demand. So. Just very briefly, those statements went through uh, how they might look at speeding up delivery of the, the graphene transfer and delivery of the Fens Reservoir. Um, they set out how they're going to explore strategic resources over the long term so these issues can be addressed uh, going forward. And they are looking at wider water management, so looking at um, agriculture and nature based solutions. So that's looking at um, how they can actually help water um, get back into the chalk aquifer by uh, looking at land use and bringing forward projects, you know, working with local farmers to help do that. I guess in the shorter term, more directly, they're looking at a water credit scheme. So that will be looking for developers to effectively contribute funds, which will then be used to um, retrofit uh, buildings. So go in and make existing buildings more efficient because a lot of our older building stock actually uses a lot more water because of its fiction fittings than, than newer developments. Uh, alongside uh, bringing forward a credit scheme, 
they're also already bring forward a pilot scheme. So some of that funding I mentioned would be used to go in and retrofit uh, buildings to monitor how effective it is. So you can actually work out how best to retrofit and properly understand the impacts of those schemes. Um, it also shows the work being looked at water efficiency, but also water reuse. So one of the problems we've had in using water efficiently is that there's again been a lot of regulations uh, making it actually, actually hard to water, water reuse. So what I mean by that is using, say, um, grey water from your bath to flush your toilet or taking rainwater off your roof to do it. So what they're doing through this project is actually looking at how they can change regulations to allow that to happen. And a lot of this work is actually feeding into national um, guidance and those building regs. So we are being used really as a pilot nationally and a lot of the learning that's happening in Cambridge will be rolled out nationally. Um, they're also looking more and more at how they can roll out smart meters. So not just having Cambridge Water have got quite good um, metering rates, so houses with water meters already, but they're also looking at how we can bring forward smart meter well. So you're probably more familiar with your power having that, but obviously it's important um, for water to see what water you're using, but it can help them identify where there is constant flow in dwellings. So they may be able to write to you and say, we've noticed your meter is constantly running. Can we come in there and fix your toilet? So all these measures, I have to say, are bring, bringing significant pace. Uh, a lot of money is being spent bringing forward uh, specific consultants to work on these projects, and the water scarcity group is making rapid pace on these items. Um, so coming back, I guess, to our local plan, what does it all mean for us? Well, we're very much part of a liaising with all these groups and working our own water efficiency policies because we need to understand in planning for development um, that there is sufficient water supply uh, across our plan period to meet the needs that we've identified through our plan making process and considering how our development trajectory fits in with that. Um, looking at our local plan timetable, as I mentioned, a report was considered by members uh, about a week or two ago where we were uh, providing an update on our local plan timetable. And the last time our, our currently adopted local development scheme of a timetable um, was last updated in 2022 and government asked all councils to update their timelines. So we've done that. But um, we identified a series of uncertainties that made us made it difficult for us to identify um, a very specific program and all of these are external factors so the water issue i've just gone through in detail but clearly also challenges for our plan are looking into uh, the transport issues uh, and the um, uncertainty i guess created by the cambridge 2040 plan um, and also we're grappling with uh, a brand new local plan making system being developed by the government and new regulations about how we prepare our local plans are expected to come out uh, later this year. So what we've done is uh, we've agreed uh, an um, indicative timetable um, where we would be looking to be what the government are terming a front runner under this new system. So our indicative timeline anticipates we would start this um, process uh, in 2025. So clearly that's later than we anticipated in our original timeline. But the benefits we see of the new system are in its structured timing of the stages you go through in plan making, actually the overall process might end up being quicker than if we stay with the original plan making approach. Some of you might recall how long it took our previous local plan examination to finish. So I think the overall examination at the end of that process took us around four years. So the new process is intended to have a fixed timeline for that end process. So in many ways, whilst there may be delay in getting on to that new system, by running the new system, our hope is that we may actually catch up um, at the end. 
So you'll find we have published an indicative timeline now on our website and we've committed to members uh, to keep them updated. And we're, when we're able to firm up that timeline, um, we will come back and publish a new report. And that's the end of my presentation. Thank you, John. Again, another really interesting presentation, which we'll share. Um, thank you, Nancy, as well, for staying on tonight. So um, we've got literally five minutes left for questions. Has anyone got any questions for John and Nancy? Uh, Councillor Anna Bradman. Thank you, Heather. Um, thank you very much indeed, John, for that very uh, succinct presentation. Um, do you think that there is any risk that we won't be able to develop in the way that we've been told to by government because of the uh, the the scarcity of water? So uh, I my impression, my understanding, as I think a lot of progress has been made regarding the uh, water scarcity group. So all those measures really are addressing the short term, but also work is going on looking at the longer term, so 2040 plus. So whilst in many ways we still need to see uh, the outcome of these processes, I am actually reassured that um, significant resources now are being directed to addressing water supply in the Cambridge area simply as a recognition of how important Cambridge is you know to the UK and the UK economy so I hope that all those measures I've set out will enable us to show um, how we can meet needs sustainable but clearly that will be an issue we continue to revisit as we come back to you and prepare the plan. Thank you John. Thank you. Um, and then Councillor Carla Hoffman has put a question in the chat. How has the potential new sewage works been looked at on saving or reusing water? So uh, again, not quite within our remit, but I understand they are exploring whether there is potential for water reuse um, from, from the new works. Um, so clearly that could contribute to, you know, using supply and there are, there's a lot of innovation going on that regional plan. It's worth a read. So not direct to this area, they're even looking at things like desalination, particularly in more coastal areas. So there's a there's a huge uh, now push, I think, at the UK level about how we can use our water more carefully. And just Good. to add to that, the um, Cambridge Waters Water Resources Management Plan does take into account some water recycling from the new Milton um, water treatment works if that goes ahead. Good, thank you, Nancy. OK, so um, I think that's about it. Thank you all. Um, thanks very much for staying with us. There's quite a lot of information there, I think, for everybody. Um, so uh, a lot of good, really good presentations that have just come to the end. As we said, we will share those. We will uh, make sure we answer the, any questions in the chat that we've not answered um, and we will share uh, the video as well. So we ex please expect to see that. And then just one final plea, please, please ask your parish clerks to come and join us at our event um, on the 17th of April. Um, that would be really, really helpful. Uh, we've got lots to tell them, lots to show them and lots of really great things that we're doing across the service as well to try and improve um, how we how we kind of communicate and interact with our residents and yourselves. So, OK, thank you very Final much. Word. I may. Final words to by to me. Sorry. Yes. Thank you, everyone. We do want to engage with parish councils. We're here to work with you because you know your areas and we will definitely want to work as a team. So please feel free to send us questions, contact us uh, if you have requests. And, you know, if you want us to come and talk to you at your meetings, yell. Thank you. Thank you very much to everybody, to all the officers <laughs> for those very helpful presentations thank you anna thank you thank all. you everyone good night everybody Happy Easter. yeah thank, thank you. you good night <laughs> good night